Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, I am extremely excited and proud to host today David Ramirez, the Senior Marketing Manager over at Tint. Uh, David is a number of things, but a marketing uh, nerd is probably at the highest level of that priority list. He's also one of the um, co-founders of um, the San Japan conference in town um, and is currently the executive director for that initiative. Um, David eats, sleep, eats, sleeps, breathes marketing. Uh, before this, he was working at UTSA's SBDC, um, supporting them with their marketing education as well. Um, so if you haven't heard the word marketing enough so far, you're probably going to hear a little bit more of it. But one of the things that I love about David is that he makes it very uh, relatable. He's also uh, very vibrant um, and engaging, and he really knows what he's talking about. So while it might sound like there's a lot of complication to it, he really brings it down to earth. And uh, today for the session, we're talking about value and messaging, which is the core of marketing. And so uh, there is not another person that I could think of that would be better suited to talk about these topics and just in general, this broader topic uh, and industry. So. David, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with uh, our community. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to chat with the fantastic San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week and Launch SA community. Um, I'm almost used to you not having a beard, uh, so I'm still working through that. But uh, yeah, I, I hope I can live up to your expectations. Lots of pressure today. Well, welcome everyone. I am beyond excited to have this chat with you today. Uh, San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week is something that I always mark on my calendar. And so uh, I'm just so pleased that I get to talk about marketing uh, and kind of just go into this with you. So it wouldn't be a business presentation if we didn't have some sort of obligatory uh, intro slide. And so to Ryan's uh, introduction, I am the Senior Marketing Manager at Tint. Tint works with the world's top brands to discover, curate, and capture social content. Sorry, I'm trying to finish up a cough drop here. So in addition to that, uh, Executive Director of San Japan, I am the founder and principal at SDM Ramirez LLC, which is a special event and brand marketing consultancy. I contribute to International Festival and Events Magazine, where I'm a writer. I think I have an article due today, so put that on my list. And then I'm also a mentor and session lead for Break, Bass, and Launch, which is a phenomenal culinary accelerator hosted by the great people of Launch SA and the Helm Business Accelerator Program, which is just super exciting and currently recruiting cohorts for their fall uh, group. So if you're interested in helming your business, please check out the Helm, uh, mybusiness.com, which is a great program from uh, Lift Fund here in San Antonio. So we have a roadmap for our discussion today, an extra bullet point at the end, which will be something surprising. And so we are going to look at the story of Halloid. If you don't know who they are, that's okay. We will discover it together. Talk about the ideas and influence, look at pains and gains, dig into a little bit of product value, discuss what is truly valuable and what is not. And then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. So part of this framework and some of the discussion that we're going through is based on Alexander Osterwalder's Value Propos Proposition Design book and framework. If you are not familiar with Osterwalder, uh, he is the founder of the Strategizer organization. He's written this value prop book. He's written a number of books on business model canvassing, designing value-based businesses, and uh, designing unique business models. So. If you want to learn more about some of this process, if you'd like to get all the worksheets and stuff, I highly encourage you to check out strategizer.com or you can just buy this book off of Amazon or your favorite local bookseller for about 20 to 30 bucks. It's a great read, especially if you find this session interesting. So let's begin. I wanna take you back to the 1950s. At that point, there was a company in Rochester, New York known as the Halloid Photochemical Company. Uh, Halloid built an entire empire around developing photochemical processing. And so this is back in the days where you would have your celluloid film, you'd have your actual film, and then they would use a bunch of chemicals, a bunch of paper 
to make your photos actually happen. And so they had a research and development division that was working on, you know, what is the future of photography? What is the future of, of this industry? And they developed this box. And it wasn't just any box. This box uh, used a combination of chemicals and light and ink and toner to replicate and exactly copy the thing that was placed on top of it. Does that sound familiar? Does anyone want to guess what that was? Yeah, so the Haloid Photochemical Processing Company developed the very first copy machine. Now, the research and development division was super excited that this thing happened. They were pumped that it was going to be a thing that they can produce in the world. And so they brought it to the business arm and said, hey, we've invented this thing. We think it has a lot of potential. You know, what do we do? So at that point, that box probably would have costed a business somewhere between ten dollars and $15,000 in 1950s money, which is easily close to $100,000 today. So they said, you know, I don't think this is going to be a thing. I think that photochemical processing and using celluloid film is going to be now and forever. This industry will never change, and so we should just scrap it. It's like, okay, that's not a great result for all the effort and all the work that we've put into developing this product. What else do we have? Well, I think it's a niche product. I think it's something you could probably sell to the government, maybe some of the big universities. Let's spin it off. We will, you know, try to make some money off of it. We'll sell a couple and then see what happens. Like, okay, that's not another great outcome. So their team thought and thought and thought about what do we do? What's the right way to, to market this, to sell this, to, to develop it? And then finally, their team realized they were focused too much on the features. They were focused too much on selling the product and not selling the thing that the product did, not selling the actual value that that product created in the world. And so they dug deep, thought about it, and realized that the name of the game was not selling these photo processing boxes. It was selling bureaucracy. It was selling the ability to track information. It was selling bureaucrats on documentation. It was selling the way to organize and manage data across large scale organizations. All of this was gonna be empowered by the value created by this machine. And so Haloid rebranded a couple of years later as the Xerox Corporation. And Xerox today has you know, more than $15 billion in worldwide holdings. When, well, many of us, I know there's a couple of, of Zoomers on the call, many of us will say, hey, can you Xerox that, right? They ultimately became the name for the process because they were so deeply embedded and so deeply creative and founding of the space. And it's so interesting that at one point, people in a boardroom were saying, there's no value in a copy machine. There's no value. This whole Xerox thing is not worth anything. And I think this is always a great way to start the conversation around value and marketing. Because much of the time, we get caught up on the features. We get caught up on the way it looks or behaves. And we lose sight of the fact that as we, as entrepreneurs, as business people, as marketers and creatives, as we are trying to sell or, or push a service or a product, it's not about the way that it looks or how shiny it is. It's about the inherent value that it creates in the world. And so as we go through this, we want to keep in mind that things have changed. 2020, based on the Hootsuite State of Digital Report, found the most wide-scale adoption of social media and digital media out of any year in history. We found people moving platforms in record numbers. We found boomers ending up on Instagram. We found Gen X and Gen Y, millennials, ending up on TikTok. We saw Zoomers, Gen Z, start to get really active in platforms like Dispo and Clubhouse. And we even saw Gen Alpha, which is going to be turning 13 or 14 this year, um, start getting engaged with social media and start getting their very first social media accounts. And so moving forward 2021 and beyond, there is a seismic shift 
in the way that we are going to be messaging and ideating and considering data, considering value, considering the way that we articulate our products and services, especially across digital spaces. And so that is the ultimate lens for this conversation, and I hope it'll be useful for everyone. Now, it's important to know that lots of the things that we're going to be talking about today are really about reimagining your current product or service. This is not me advocating that you etch a sketch and start from scratch. It's just really reviewing things and making sure that we have updated, that we have improved, that we are being iterative in the way that we are marketing. And uh, a couple of months ago, I kept doing this webinar and teaching this, this online workshop called Social Content Reset. And we're not gonna get too much into it, but really, if you have not updated your content in six months or a year, uh, things have completely changed. Consumer expectations have completely changed. And so it's time for us to be updating, to be making these changes and to be doing it much more meaningfully than we may have done in the past. So messaging and marketing, they require ideas. And so I love using these basic guidelines from Agile Product Development. It's another fantastic book if you're interested, in, especially in developing or growing some sort of technology or technical product. And so they advocate the idea of brainstorming with intention. So as we go through this, if you're taking notes, if you're playing along at home, uh, these are the rules that we're gonna be guiding this conversation. So number one, always focus on quantity over quality while you're brainstorming. Because a lot of the time, it's just a matter of getting all the ideas down on the piece of paper, of just kind of vomiting all of the bad stuff up first, and then sort of sorting through it and panning for gold. So really don't focus on quality. If you write something down and it's stupid or terrible or just bad, that's okay because you've gotten it out of your head and now you have room to start working on something really good or really creative. That said, withhold all criticism. You never know if it's actually good or bad. In the heat of the moment, you might say, this is terrible, I would never use this. And then maybe when you think about it or dwell on it, uh, it becomes good or you see an opportunity to do something with it. So don't criticize as you are brainstorming or going through the exercises and things that we talk about during this workshop. Withhold all criticism, leap on it overnight, and then come back to it again. Welcome unusual ideas. I was just having this conversation with someone about how IHOP, when they did their International House of Burger campaign, it was completely bizarre. It was off brand, it was different. People thought it was like a marketing faux pas, but realistically it did what it was supposed to do. It got IHOP in the news, it got them on TV, and it made them have one of the best years on record because of that campaign. So welcome unusual ideas. Don't be afraid of trying new things because this new, status quo, this new paradigm that we are coming into post-COVID or as post-COVID as Texas can be, um, it's all about people that are gonna be innovating. And lastly, combine, improve ideas. You know, marketing is not about being perfect. Marketing is all about iteration. And so you get a little bit better each and every time. And so if it's not perfect the first time, that's okay. Don't focus too much about being perfect. A great marketer once told me it's so much better for things to be done than for things to be perfect. And you can always iterate and do it again a little bit later. So as we also work through this, uh, something that I am very passionate about and a, a, a resource that I highly recommend is Dr. Robert Cialdini. Um, he is really like the grandfather of psychology and marketing. And so he just released a new edition of his, you know, amazing influential book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And so I would encourage you to pick this up. It actually just came out a few months ago. Um, or you can go to a, a secondhand bookstore and buy the old one, because I just reread it recently. And it still holds true, still holds a lot of water and credence. And so in the book, Cialdini says that all forms of marketing, all forms of public relation, all forms of what we essentially consider business influence or business persuasion can be boiled down to these seven elements. And so if you're ever wondering if you're actually driving people forward or encouraging people to do something, if you're truly marketing, one of my favorite quick checks to do is to look at this list and see if you can actually connect it to whatever you're trying to accomplish. And so reciprocity is the idea 
that if you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's why people do things like giving out free samples at uh, retail locations. That's why people might give you free bread at a restaurant. That's why people may give you a free quote or a free audit for a service. Because if you get something for free, people feel like there's a need for a reciprocal uh, relationship, right? There's need for reciprocity. For commitment, if you can get someone to make a micro commitment, it's so much easier for them to commit again a little bit later. And so the micro commitment could be come and stop in or try the free sample or sign up for our newsletter or download the thing. And every time you get them to make one more commitment, it's a little bit easier for you to ask them for money and actually get a sale. Next is social proof. Social proof is the idea that uh, when we see people out there that we appreciate or love or respect doing the thing, that's proof that we should also be doing the thing, buying the thing, engaging with the thing. And that leads us into authority. If you have an expert, uh, let's say me for this workshop, you may have never have heard of Robert Cialdini, but I hope that someone on this call is going to say, hey, that guy from Entrepreneurship Week said I should go buy this book. He seemed to know kind of what he was talking about, so I'm going to go buy the book, right? That's leaning on that authority as a source of influence. Liking is, I like this person, so if they say I should go check out this restaurant or try this wine or do this thing, I'm going to do it because I like them, not because they're necessarily an expert, but because I like them. Scarcity we in marketing land always just call it FOMO, right? It's the fear of missing out. And so appealing to that uh, element of scarcity. And then lastly is unity, which is truly one of the most powerful forms of influence out there. And it's the idea that if you are like me, if you believe like me, if you behave like me, then you will do the thing or like the thing or buy the thing that I am buying. And so let's back that up because that can be a little bit confusing. So with unity, Let's consider the Dallas Cowboys. If you are out in the world and you see someone in a Dallas Cowboys jersey and you two are wearing a Dallas Cowboys jersey or you are a fan of the Cowboys, then immediately without you knowing who they are, without you like understanding them or making the introduction, there is some sort of tribal affiliation. Like, oh, hey, you like the Cowboys? I like the Cowboys. We should be friends now. And it happens all the time. You know, you fly somewhere in an airport. Oh, where are you from? San Antonio. I'm from San Antonio. Oh, cool. And then you start having that conversation. You went to this high school, I went to that high school. And there's that conversation, even if you don't know each other. So unity is the idea of creating these tribes because humans are inherently tribal, we're inherently social. And so you use things, constructs, whether social, political, emotional, brand driven. Apple is really great at creating these unity tribes. Like there's Apple people, there's Jeep people, right? There's Spurs people. And so uh, Unity is one of the most powerful. So again, if you need to do quick checks, if you need a little bit more reference, highly encourage you to check out the book. The audio book is also really good as well if that's how you prefer to consume your content. And so again, just kind of setting the scene for this conversation. Now, part of this is understanding, again, that there have been major shifts in the way that people act and behave. We saw in 2020 with the BLM protests, with all of the, the civil unrest, with the pandemic itself, with all the political situation, people's views, people's affinities, people's connection to brands have completely shifted. And so if you have not reviewed the people that you're trying to sell to, the people that you're trying to engage with, um, really, you could just be yelling out in a crowd, and that is not truly marketing. That's not even communications. That's just you attempting to find your way. So using these tools that we discussed today and using these processes that we discussed today, um, it's all about breaking people into constituent groups. It's all about understanding what motivates them and then how to best articulate the inherent value of the product or service that you have created and sell to get them into the right people's hands. And ultimately with marketing, with communications, the name of the game is to try to make you just a little bit of money. And so let's dig in. Hopefully that's enough theory. So we start the conversation with pains and gains. 
Uh, this is really thinking about your customer and the reason that they would have to buy or engage or connect with you. And so when you look at the Osterwalder method, when you look at that value prop book, it says that you can start in a bunch of different places in the process. But for me, I think this is the easiest one. So let's talk about pain. Now, when we think about pain, obviously you may think like literally physical pain, but pain from a marketing and from a business creation perspective is really all about the things that people are missing or makes them uncomfortable or obstacles or, or just issues in people's lives that they are trying to solve with a product or service. And so the very first question for you is what are the obstacles and risks for your product and service? What makes it hard for people to buy it from you? Could it be that the English toffee that you sell is only available at a little boutique shop in Bernie, which is my current obstacle in my life? Could it be that you are located in a weird part of town? Could it be that people are uneducated on why your product is actually valuable? You know, what is it that can make it difficult for people to access or become aware or engage with your product or service? Next, what are the negative consequences that you can help your customers avoid? There are some things that uh, are just kind of easy, right? Like if you are in food service, kind of the, the basic negative consequence is if someone is hungry, you can help them stop being hungry, right? In the insurance world, if someone is at risk, you can help mitigate some of the risk. With things like emergency repairs, like plumbing or electrical, again, the negative consequences that people are trying to avoid or resolve are things that are just very clear. But for some things like retail, for makeup, for consumer brands, uh, you may have to dig a little bit deeper to figure out what are the consequences, what are the things that you can help your customers avoid, or at least help them overcome as they connect and grow an affinity with your brand. What common mistakes do your customers make? Like, what are the issues that, again, you can help them overcome? Could a common mistake be overextending when they uh, have their golf swing? And so you've invented some sort of back brace or training mechanism to help them get around it. Could a common mistake be that they don't know how to parallel park? And that's why this car that you're selling has parallel parking assist, right? This is another possible pain that you could be marketing against that you could be talking about and articulating. And that has a deep inherent value that you can sell to a customer. And then lastly, are there any sort of cultural, emotional, functional, or other biases that trigger pain? And we're going to dig into that a little bit later as we get further on into the presentation. So let's consider a product. You know, what are the obstacles or risks for this blue bottle that we are selling here? It could be that it's only available in certain places. It could be that it's only available online. It could be that it's only available in the spring, it's seasonal, right? There are lots of different obstacles that could potentially make this hard to acquire. What are the negative consequences that you're trying to, to help your customer with? Maybe this is a dandruff shampoo and you're trying to help them not have dandruff. Maybe this is cologne and you're trying to help them not smell. The thing about pains is you're really looking at the negative. So if you have that one person in your shop or that one cousin or nephew that's always really negative about it, get them to come in and help you do this part of the audit. What are the pain points? What are the bad things in people's lives that your product or service or business could help resolve? And again, thinking about cultural, emotional, and functional biases, you know, maybe I've been using head and shoulders my entire life. And so I have some deep sort of emotional connection to it. And so I'm not gonna change to your, your dandruff shampoo until you really prove that that's the right one. Or maybe my dad used Balm from Gautier as their cologne. So I have a deep emotional connection to that scent and I'm not gonna to switch to your cologne, right? There's lots of additional baggage that you can never anticipate or could be really difficult to guess. Um, and these are just things that you consider, that you iterate, that you kind of, of think through. And if it's gonna to be too hard to compel someone, if it's gonna to be too difficult to make that sell, then perhaps that's not actually your ideal customer. Maybe perhaps you need to re-examine the value that that product creates and the actual problems that it's trying to solve. All right, that was the negative part. Let's jump over to the more positive part. Understanding gate. What would make them happy? 
And the most common savings that we talk about for happiness are going to be time, money, or effort. Does this save them time? That's why they're ordering takeout. That's why they have someone cutting their lawn. That's why they have someone building the house for them. Is it going to save them money? That's why they may want something a little bit cheaper. That's why they may want something that makes them money, like some sort of financial product. Or does it save them effort? Yes, they could hail a taxi or drive themselves, but they'd rather spend a little bit of time and a little bit of money to take an Uber instead, because it just saves them on the effort of finding parking, right? So really, as you start to think about the gains, the positive side of your product or service, you know, what are you saving them? What are you getting them that makes them happy that they couldn't just get for themselves? And so with things like restaurants, a lot of the time, it's the time and the effort that you're going to be saving someone, right? They don't want to cook for themselves. They don't want to have to like spend the time in the kitchen and spend all the time putting it together and plating it and serving it. And so a restaurant would save them on both time and effort. So after you've understood what your savings are going to be or what your customer savings will be, next, think about what would increase the likelihood of adoption. And this goes back to thinking about the pains and you can sort of look at them as opposite sides of the same coin. So when you think about the likelihood of adoption, this could be things like cost. Yeah, I really, really like Charmin toilet paper, but the HEB toilet paper is like half the price and feels the same. So why am I not gonna just use HEB toilet paper instead, right? So cost could be a major factor. Investment, you know, yeah, I have my old clunker car, but if I get this new car, it's not gonna require as many repairs, it's not gonna require as much work, and it'll ultimately in the long run save me a little bit of money because it's more fuel efficient or this or that. And then status. Yeah, I could watch the Spurs game from the nosebleeds, but really for just a little bit more money, I can buy the box seats, come down 600 feet, and actually be able to see the pupils on the basketball players like as they're on the court. And I want to be seen down there. I don't want to be the schmuck in the, the high seats, right? So really think about a, another aspect of value. Like how do you increase the adoption by speaking to one of these very specific elements? Lastly, again, the opposite side of that, can you build a social, cultural, spiritual, or an emotional connection? And I think a great one is actually happening next week. We have Fiesta coming up. And with Fiesta, like really you could put papel picado and like Mexican artwork or like Mexican style stuff on almost anything. And San Antonians will just like, boom, Fiesta, yes, I'm here for it, right? Like we love to be part of that cultural experience, the cultural movement. And so that's why for the next couple of weeks, everyone's going to be doing something fiesta oriented or it's june so it's pride month so everyone's doing rainbow stuff or pride oriented stuff or you know especially in san antonio being a very uh, roman catholic and hispanic city it's easter season or it's lent and so everyone's doing fish sandwiches or everyone is doing something for easter brunch right so there's lots of ways for you to be part of this conversation to be part of this value and again it's all about looking not just at your product but at your customer and all of the aspects, all the elements that make them who they are. So I think we already talked a little bit about the car example. What would make them happy? Like this car is fast, so it could save them on time. It's cost effective because it's a little tiny car. Well, it's a BMW, so probably not that cost effective. Um, it could be a status thing because it's a BMW. It could be an investment because they don't depreciate in value people that go to XYZ school or maybe executives that work at XYZ company all drive BMWs. So it could be a status thing as well, right? There's lots of different ways to look at the specific appeal for whatever product it might be. And this may feel a little bit scattershot and it's just because looking at the attendee list, I see people from retail and automotive and service and food and all over the place. So if you have questions, if some of this is not really clear, please go ahead and drop questions in chat and I'd love to answer them as they come up because this can be a lot of information. So getting past pains and gains, looking at the best practices, really understand that people have different motivations. What motivates me to buy something is different than what will motivate my grandma, is different than what will motivate my niece. And so let's dig into that for a second. Let's think about McDonald's. 
So my grandma will go to McDonald's now that some of them are open inside. And she will sit there for her free senior citizens cup of coffee and she will nurse that coffee and hang out with her friends. So for her, there is a social element and there's a cost element, right? She gets the free coffee and she also gets to hang out with other people who are getting the free coffee, people who are like her going back to the unity conversation and have somewhere to be that's air conditioned, comfortable. She actually has a Facebook now, God help us. Uh, so they have free Wi-Fi and they're not going to be harassed. They know that it's safe to hang out inside of McDonald's. Now, when I go to McDonald's, it's usually because I woke up late, didn't get a chance to pack lunch, uh, maybe just need to eat something before a morning meeting and I need my caffeine fix. And so I'm in the McDonald's drive through because it's easy, it's fast. I don't have to mess with anything. It's relatively inexpensive. And when I walk in with my big frappe, um, it's kind of obnoxious and I like to rub it in people's faces, right? Like there's just sort of that cultural thing where I get to compare myself to folks that are drinking Starbucks or other coffee sources. So that's the reason for me attending McDonald's or going to McDonald's. And then for my lovely niece, she goes to McDonald's because of BTS. It's a cultural and social thing. Like she wants to go to get the chicken nuggets and the BTS meal. She's obsessed with BTS and K-pop right now. And so that's her motivation. It's all about social status. Like if she didn't get that BTS meal, she'd probably be ostracized, have to like go live in the forest or something. So that's her motivation for it. And these are all part of the same restaurant. So really, as you start to look at your customer base, as you try to understand these pains and gains, just really be aware that it's gonna vary across customer segments. And so you're gonna to have to kind of break them down into their larger constituent groups. Is my niece alone with her BTS obsession? No, you could probably do, well, they did, an entire marketing campaign against just that younger generation. Is my grandma alone with hanging out at McDonald's for free coffee? No, go to a McDonald's that's open at six o'clock in the morning and you will see a slew of old people there hanging out getting their free senior citizens coffee. Am I alone at 8.30 trying to like get my, my McMuffin and my coffee before my 9 a.m. call? Absolutely not, because there's way too many people in the drive through and I'm always late. Uh, so if my boss is on this call, I'm sorry, that's why I'm late. It's McDonald's fault, it's not mine. So really think about the motivations for people doing things. Next, really seek out concrete motivations and outcomes. I know we talked a little bit about uh, affinity, you know, like, oh, it smells like my dad or it reminds me of my mom or there's some sort of like deeper emotional connection. That's great, but that's gonna be a lot of one-offs. So really seek out concrete motivations. Again, going back to my grandma example, like there are lots of old people, they need somewhere to be, they like free coffee because they're on fixed income. And so that's like a very concrete set of motivations, right? Don't get too granular because once you start breaking audiences and, and your prospects and customers up into smaller and smaller groups, it's really easy for you to get lost in the weeds. And if you're a large organization, you can, dig down and start to mess with that. But realistically, especially for small businesses, you know, four, five, maybe six groups is gonna be all that you have the bandwidth to really explore and think about. And lastly, social and emotional motivators might be more important than the functional. So my niece would have paid almost any amount for those stupid chicken nugget BTS meals right? Because that is a social motivator for her. Could she have gotten chicken nuggets at Bill Miller's or at churches or at Popeye's or at her elementary school, you know, cafeteria, I guess, middle school cafeteria? Yeah, absolutely. It's not about the price. It's not about the function. It's specifically about that social outcome. And so a lot of the times we have to make that appeal to social and emotional outcomes or motivators rather than just focusing on the functional one. We're not all looking for the cheapest price. We're not all looking for the fastest car or the easiest transaction. Sometimes we do have other motivations uh, that drive us to make our decisions as we, we encounter and engage with marketing. All right, let's get into the product side. So with products, we have a couple of different types that I like to identify. I think it's also very important for you to understand that each different product has, again, different motivations, different use cases, different opportunities. And so with product type, let's think physical, obviously the retail example that you see in the photo is gonna be the easiest one. Intangible could be stuff like 
insurance. It could be stuff like getting something repaired or fixed. It could be things like uh, an accountant or a lawyer, right? Something that you don't actually see or feel, but something that you use. It could be things like giving to charity, uh, which is another big appeal. Digital, obviously, as someone who sells software for a living, digital is king. It could be eBooks. It could be stuff like Netflix, you know, subscription services. And then financial, you tend to get into things like banking, some types of insurance, some types of other financial services. And we usually put them separately because there's so many different rules and guidelines and personally ethical endeavors that are around that. And so I usually don't try to touch on financial because um, it's just, it's gross. So we talked about pains and gains on the customer side. Now that we're in the product side, let's talk about pain relief. And so in a perfect world for every pain that your customer has, that's based on a product that you may sell, you would have a reliever that comes from that product. So the pain relief from that product could be something quite simple, like does it save on time or money or effort? It could be something like, does it fix a performance issue? You know, does it have something that's a new feature? Does it perform better? Is it enhanced? Does it have a higher quality? Is it longer lasting? You know, does it eliminate risk? So financially, does it get rid of risk because it's less likely to break or it's a more secure uh, tool? Socially, does it eliminate risk? Like, am I gonna be seen doing this thing and it's a good social thing or bad social thing? Technically, does it eliminate risk? And then ultimately, does it somehow relieve the barriers that keep a customer from getting to you. And I think that's something that, again, we saw a lot of in 2020. Many shops, many organizations and small businesses I've worked with over the years have said that they were absolutely opposed to being part of e-commerce. They did not want to launch an e-commerce shop. They did not want their restaurant on Uber Eats or DoorDash or anything like that. And then 2020 forced them to make a decision. Either you close your doors or you make the shift to e-commerce to some sort of online platform, right? And many of them have found that even though there were some barriers, there's definitely a learning curve and you know lots of opportunity because some of them have very pricey uh, costs associated with them. It opens doors to new audiences. It helps you get new people. It helps you connect with new folks. And so one of my favorite examples, is Antonelli's Cheese Shop in Austin, uh, so apologies that I'm talking about an Austin organization on San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week, but they were a gourmet tea shop that did a lot of events, did lots of workshops, did lots of stuff in shop, and then the pandemic hit. And what they did is they launched a membership program where people could buy things like cheese of the month for six months, which was a little bit expensive, but really good for some folks. They did a lot of virtual workshops, they spotlit employees, they connected with vendors and talked about how even though it's a pandemic, you still have to go out and milk the cows and get the cheese. And so they built an entire new audience through social media, through their online platforms, and that eliminated barriers that were just kind of inherent in a small boutique shop on the southeast side of Austin, uh, you know, the, just in a strip mall. So really, Think about how you just make it easier for a customer to buy, connect, engage, and not just easier for them, but how it fixes some sort of pain in their life. We've talked about pain relief. Let's talk about gains because it's all about the gains. So number one, is there some sort of outcome that exceeds expectation? And really, it's the thing about delighting customers, right? It's good to eat something that's good. Like you'll eat something, you'll feel good, you'll feel full, that's great. But if you have a really good experience, if you're truly delighted by the service, by the food, by the ambiance, by the location, by, by whatever it might be, that is how you turn people into your marketers. That's how you turn them into your advocates. That's how you make people into influencers for you. So really, what is it about your product or service that can help you delight a customer, that makes it exceed expectations and ultimately outperforms the competitors. Why should they buy it from you when odds are you're probably not the only person in the city or in the metroplex or in the state that sells it? And again, as the world gets increasingly smaller due to e-commerce, due, due to being able to buy things across the internet, why buy local, why buy from you if they can save a couple of bucks going online? 
And that's going to be on you to really articulate and, and figure out. Does it make a customer life easier? We talked a little bit about that in the pain section. And then ultimately, does it align with the customer's criteria for success and failure? And as you are thinking about your customer base, every different core set of customers are going to have different levels of tolerance for what is failure. Like for me, if I make a reservation at a restaurant, lots of food things, I might be hungry. Um, if I make a reservation at a restaurant and it's supposed to be for 1030 and I get there and they're like, well, we accidentally let your table go, but we can get you seated in 15 minutes. For me, that is acceptable. I am not going to think it's the end of the world. I'm not going to be upset. For some people, that is a deal breaker. That's the end of it. And they're going to go write you a nasty review on Yelp and it's going to be the end of the world. And so part of doing your research and understanding how people have changed, especially if they've been stuck at home for a year because of 2020, is understanding where failure is acceptable and where it is not. So maybe they want to get seated early, but they're okay if the food takes a long time to come up. Or maybe they don't mind waiting for seating as long as the food comes out quickly. Or maybe they like getting the food delivered, but they really want it hot, and so there's not really a good way for them to succeed on that. So really, it's not just about the pains and gains, it's also what is tolerable to your, your customer base. So as we kind of get towards the, the tail end of this chat and this conversation, uh, the real question is, it, is it valuable? Is what you are selling or shilling or whatever you want to call it, is it actually valuable to some sort of audience that is out there? So number one, value is always subjective. And that's something that people need to wrap their mind around, especially if you're a new business owner or a new entrepreneur. It's never ever personal, or perhaps it's rarely personal. It's always subjective. If I don't like your product or service, it's not because you're a bad person or I'm a bad person. It's just because I don't see the value in it. And if I don't see the value right away, then odds are other people who are like me, who believe like me, act like me, uh, earn like me, whatever the, the breakdown is that you do, will also not see the value as well. So really think, well, make peace that it's subjective, it's not personal, and then truly think about how you can articulate that. Value is only created through the relationship with between a customer and a business. And so if that relationship does not exist, if people don't even know that you exist as a thing on this planet, if people are not even aware that you are an option to solve the pain or to get a gain, then there is no value to be created. And so always think about how people are finding you, make sure that your SEO is good, make sure you're up to date on Google Maps, make sure that you are networking and connecting with folks because value is only created when there is a relationship, when people are aware of each other. Going back to the McDonald's example, value is specific and unique to each and every customer segment. So what's valuable to my grandma is different than what's valuable to my mom, which is different than what's valuable to me or my niece or my brother or my dog. And so just really be aware that value is going to be specific and changing. And what works for one customer segment, the messaging, the marketing, the communication strategy, may not necessarily work for others. And there's some stuff that is truly evergreen. Lots of people like punch cards. Lots of people like loyalty programs. Lots of people love a good deal. But when you really get down to the people that are going to be your best customers that are going to come back day after day, year after year, this is where you really have to dig deep and figure out what's important and what is valuable to that specific segment. The value is not just about solving problems. And this is, again, something that we encounter quite a bit, especially with newer entrepreneurs. It's about what you will not solve. And actually, not should be underlined. So I apologize for that. So you cannot be everything to everyone. And that's OK. You shouldn't try to be everything to everyone. We have stores like HEB and Walmart that accomplish that very well because they dump a ton of money into it. And even then, there's some people that refuse to shop at HEB or refuse to shop at Walmart or shop at whatever store, right? So don't just think about solving the problems. Think about what problems you can't solve. I was recently shopping for a contractor to do some work on my roof, and they saw the house. I live in a very old house on the inner west side. And they're like, honestly, we're not a, an ideal operation 
to take on a historic building like that. So um, we're not going to be able to quote you out today. And that's great because I would have much rather them tell me that up front than to have them say, hey, yeah, we can absolutely do it. And then they screw it up or I'm unhappy with the business or I'm unhappy with the work and then just seeing all the problems on the tail end. So if someone's not your ideal customer, if someone is not someone, you know, ideal customers will come and go. Things will change over the life cycle of a business. And so you shouldn't just say that my customer is this and they look like this. Really think about how they're going to change. Think about how they're going to evolve and think about what you can and cannot do for some people. And make sure all of that is articulated in some way, whether it be in your marketing, in your communication, in your signage, in your service agreements, whatever, because you can't be any everything to everyone. So auditing your marketing. Here are a couple of really quick things that you can do as you start to, to deploy this and start to do these things. Is number one, Review all of your marketing material. It could be things like press releases, postcards, business cards, receipts, flyers, posters, ads. Do all these specific marketing items focus on the value that you create or is it focused on the features? And again, let's think back to the car example. Are you talking about, oh, it has a moon roof and it has these tires that do this and it has these windows that do this and this really cool console. Like, that's great. Okay, some people care about that, but more people want to know that it's a status symbol, that it goes fast, or it's super safe, or it's something that'll last a long time, right? Some deeper value rather than the fact that it has uh, heated seats. Next, as you are looking at your stuff, are you serving the right messaging to the right customer at the right time? And so think about the minute someone walks in your brick and mortar store, do you say, hey, buy the thing? No, you're probably going to welcome them. You're going to connect to them. You're going to build a connection, build a relationship, build affinity with them before you tell them to buy the thing. And the same thing should happen with your marketing, with your outreach, with your communications, your social media, your website. You know, it's like dating someone. You don't ask them to do the dirty on the very first date. You have to cultivate the relationship because if they do the dirty on the first date, odds are there may not be a second date. So really it's about creating a sustainable community that wants to come back and buy from you over and over again. And that only happens if you're serving them the right message at the right time. Next, really dig deep. And this is gonna be the hard part for a lot of folks is understanding, you know, has your customer's value expectations changed since 2020? A lot of folks may think, no, probably not. But the reality is most of America was stuck at home. For a lot of the year, a lot of the America, America lost jobs or saw people lose jobs or saw major political unrest or term, turmoil, right? Like we collectively as a society, especially stateside, um, just saw a lot of change in 2020. So how did those changes actually affect the people that you're trying to sell to or your existing customer base? And does that require you to change the way that you are articulating your marketing, your product or service? And lastly, are you focusing on value across all of your marketing touch points? And again, it's not about the features. It's not necessarily about the cost savings. Like, why should we buy from you? Why should we care about you? Why should we engage with you? And make sure that everything from the receipt to your confirmation email to even the goodbye sign at the front door articulates that it's all about value. It's all about connection. And it's all about really getting deep to understand what people want from a business. So I know it's a lot of theory. I know it may sound a little crazy or crunchy granola, but this is what marketers across the world are currently dealing with. This is what we are exploring and trying to understand. And so that is the end of the discussion or the talk part of it. I'd love to see what questions y'all may have, how we can clarify things or you know, if worse comes to worse, how we can talk specifically about a business that you're trying to work on. And I think I'm going to pull Ryan in to help with the question. No problem. Uh, 
at the moment, I don't see any. Um, don't be afraid, guys, if you're uh, thinking about <clears throat> trying to get anything answered for your business specifically, or you have something that relates to the topic of marketing that maybe we missed, that's also an opportunity. So it's your chance to get the good, so to speak. All right, so how does one focus on growth in your marketing in terms of social media? I know hashtags are important and the right messaging, but what do you what do you advise? I know that hashtags are important and the right messaging, but what do you advise? Awesome, yeah, thanks, Ren. Um, so I would say starting with understanding who you're speaking to on your social, it goes back to what we talked about every customer or prospect has a different expectation for what they want and sharing content that's relevant to them. Um, one of the challenges with building social media is again, a lot of the time we wanna just tell people to buy the thing. Hey, buy the thing, buy the thing, buy the thing. And I made the joke recently in another webinar where I said, um, you know, there are people out there that you probably went to high school with that are selling some sort of MLM product. And when you see them on social, they always say, hey, buy the thing, buy the thing, buy the thing. And you get annoyed and you end up blocking them. But then if you look at your business account, are you doing the same thing where every single post that you're making is, hey, buy the product or come stop by or do the thing? So I think, you know, number one, make sure your message is interesting. Make sure it's engaging. Number two, mix up the content. Telling someone to buy or stop by or visit the website or do something is a very heavy message. And so you have to counterweight that with some other sort of content. So that could be an employee spotlight, that could be a customer spotlight, that could you be uh, you know, really talking about a vendor or talking about a neighbor. That's why I love uh, Launch SA and San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week, because sometimes you can find other business owners that are non-competitors that you can support each other with content and talk about other people that are nearby. Uh, one of my favorite content strategies is there is a dry cleaner in Southtown and Durba, who is the owner, uh, just takes a picture of a random customer every couple of days and says, hey, Bob is a fireman and Bob just picked up his dry cleaning. And it doesn't have to be super perfect. It doesn't have to be super polished. But when people see that, they're like, oh, hey, a fireman likes to shop there. I like firemen, or I know a fireman, or my uncle was a fireman. And so if he shops there, then it must be good for other people to shop there, right? Like there's a lot of mental acrobatics that happen when you see content like that, because it's a little more interesting, a little more socially engaging. On the hashtag conversation, it's gonna vary from platform to platform. Uh, Facebook has decided that they're gonna reinstitute all their hashtag stuff, but there's not really a lot of growth opportunities that I've seen there. Um, on Instagram, you know, you probably want to have five to 10 hashtags per post. You can put the first three in the post itself and then the rest of them in the first comment beneath and make sure that you're mixing them up so they're not all either super big hashtags or super small hashtags. On Twitter, three per post is probably the magic number. And then things like LinkedIn, you really don't want more than three per post or you may get uh, shadow banned or your content seen by fewer people. And then you can get really granular, like on TikTok, hashtags don't even matter. So just pick whatever the trending hashtag is, add it to your TikTok video, and that's just how people are getting discovered. So I wouldn't stress them on TikTok itself. So that's a lot of stuff. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful, Ren. Ian, is that how you say your name? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no sweat, no sweat. He's probably gonna get some headphones or something. <laughs> All right, testing one, two. Sorry about that, had a bit of feedback there. Uh, hi, David, I wanted to ask if you have any tips for performing market validation and furthermore, kind of understanding the pains and gains of your customer and it's kind of specifying that to like a B2B situation. Yeah, awesome. So my day job is in B2B SaaS and so I love yeah, that's where I live and breathe day to day. Um, I would say as you are working on your market validation, um, starting off with something like a business model canvas. And so again, I'm a huge fan of the Osterwalder method. There's a lot of BMCs that are out there, but I really like the way that he does them. And what I recommend actually is to take a step back, start with the value proposition canvas, which is his other tool um, and go through all the exercises that are available 
through that process, then jumping over to the business model canvas and determining like, are you really trying to find a disruptive B2B model? Is it more of an innovative B2B model? Is it a B2B model that's based on value? Like what's unique to that B2B model? Because that is the, the big differentiator in the B2B space, right? And then one of my other favorite books, let me see if I can grab it. I always keep my reference books right over here. Is if you're really excited about B2B, um, one of the best concepts that I've ever encountered is the concept called category design. And so category design is the idea that you don't have to be the best at what it is you do. You just have to be the best in that specific space. And so if you're focusing down market or mid market or up market or enterprise or whatever it's going to be, like truly owning what is required for the customer base in that space and not just focusing on making money, but focusing on what we like to call net recurring revenue, right? Like it's getting a healthy customer base and expanding. And so my book recommendation, I don't know if you can see it, it's called Play Bigger. And it's all about, again, the category design process. And this tends to be a little bit of a hard read, but once you go through it, like I, I have it marked, I got to page 192 when I had my like epiphany and the clouds parted and the scales fell from my eyes and you know, all that cool stuff happened. Um, so it's a bit of a hard read, but really check it out, especially if like B2B is the, the space that you're going into. So hopefully that's like not just a non-answer and I'm pawning you off on a book, but I think that's kind of a, a great way to get there. No, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, question in the chat here. We have, uh, what would you recommend for nonprofits? Yeah, for nonprofits, it's a really hard time. I think one of the things that's um, difficult for nonprofits is the idea that your customer base has changed. And so really think about the people that donated during the pandemic, right? So I would probably do that as an exercise first. Go back to, let's say, April 2020 through December, maybe Thanksgiving 2020. Look at everyone that donated or engaged with your nonprofit and try to find similarities that are there because those are the people that truly cared about your organization because during the peak of a global pandemic, they still wanted to connect or engage or give or find some sort of like relationship there. And so see where the similarities are there. See if there's some sort of like specific value that all of those people have because those people are going to carry over into 2021. Again, also look and see, you know, did you lose a lot of donors to things like COVID, right? Did you lose people to attrition? Did you lose volunteers? And kind of understand what it is that's going to get people to come back to you. Folks, especially now that the world is, is opening up, um, there's a thing that we call revenge spending. And so the concept of revenge spending really kind of came around um, as people started to analyze relationships. So like you go through a bad breakup after a long-term relationship and studies have shown that people, male, female, non-binary, they, them, whatever, um, people do revenge spending after a bad breakup of a long-term relationship. They go out, they buy a new wardrobe, they buy a new car, they buy stuff that's expensive, which is essentially their way of sort of getting catharsis and kind of purging that old relationship out. They throw away old stuff so that they can literally get new things and kind of replace stuff that reminds them of this uh, now over relationship. We're seeing the same thing in this kind of pre post COVID world. I don't know what we're calling it. Like so much of the world still has COVID, but as Texas and the US open up more and more, we're seeing it stateside. Like people are traveling like crazy. People are eating out like crazy. People are going to events like crazy because this is their revenge spending. This is them getting back at getting stuck at home uh, for an entire year. And so things will go back to normal. Like we will see travel tours and hospitality kind of plateau out again soon. We're gonna see culinary start to plateau out again soon. This is not something that's permanent. And so, especially if you're in one of those spaces that's seeing all these revenge dollars flying around, like now is the time to strike to capture those people get them hooked, get them, you know, as part of the team. Uh, because when things plateau out again, it's still going to take a couple of years for the economy to truly recover. And what we're seeing right now is just kind of a false recovery as people just are trying to get the stir crazy and the cabin fever out. For newer nonprofits, I think, again, it goes back to value. What is the value that you are creating 
for your constituents? What's the value that you are creating for your donors? What's the value that you are creating for your stakeholders? What's the value you're creating for your employees? It's always that conversation around value. And I think one of the challenges I've heard or I've seen plenty of with nonprofits is when I ask them, why should I donate to you? Like, oh, it's because we do good work. Okay, but the food bank does good work and the zoo does good work and the university I went to does good work and the Texas diaper bank does good work. Like, it's not enough that you're doing good in the world. Like, why does your specific type of good mean more than someone else's? And it's, it's not a fair question to ask, but that's the mental acrobatics that people go through because we only have so much money that we can give. We only have so much time that we can give. And so we have to be informed enough to be able to make a decision as to why you get our cash or our time or our energy or our support compared to the hundreds and thousands of nonprofits that exist in San Antonio alone. Uh, the other thing I would say is I would also check out the San Antonio Area Foundation. They have a lot of resources for nonprofits. And so if you are actually organized as a Texas nonprofit or a 501c3, uh, the San Antonio Area Foundation has no cost resources available for you. Um, so I'd also check them out. They have some great webinars focused on, on nonprofits as well. Other questions? Feel free if you'd like to, you can unmute as well. I got a thumbs up from the person that you answered the question to, or, yeah. Okay, one more chance, extra questions. Nothing is considered dumb. I have a quick question. Um, so I'm just now starting like a product development idea and I feel like there's so many aspects that go into um, creating your outreach and creating your following and things like that. So would you suggest that I um, create my website first and then reach out to, you know, start to make a following on like TikTok, Instagram and things like of that? Or would you suggest me just getting my name out there and things like that and then building up a website? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different um, parts to that question. So uh, number one is whether or not, or like how do people get access to your product that you are creating? If they have to buy it through a website, then obviously like the website takes precedent. Realistically, we are experiencing a thing that we call social commerce. And so using Instagram, using Facebook shop, using shoppable TikTok, uh, Twitter is looking at some different options. Clubhouse has some new stuff that they're looking at. You can actually buy stuff directly through social media. And so depending on what the product is, depending on who the ideal customer is, um, you can probably, or you can often get away with just having a social following, especially if it's like in early development stages and you're trying to get people to, you know, be early adopters, social might be the, the best place to, to do a lot of that. Because realistically, websites these days, you know, if you want a really professional website, like, yes, you can get on Squarespace or Wix or GoDaddy and launch one for maybe a couple hundred bucks. But a really good, solid website, especially with a really sensible e-commerce thing or element is, you know, four to $10,000. So I would probably make sure you have a, a market fit, make sure the product is well designed, well received, make sure that you understand all the value messaging that we talked about in today's session um, before you really start putting a lot of money into the actual marketing. David, do you have a, a recommendation to accept donations? Um, I am a fan of Stripe. Uh, Stripe is usually pretty solid. The, the challenge with nonprofits is always going to be things like chargebacks. It's going to be things like verifying that you're a nonprofit. And so there's just lots of paperwork involved. I like Stripe just because they handle some of the chargeback stuff for you. Um, PayPal is always good. I mean, I think really it's more about like what the margins are going to be and how much uh, you can actually expect to come in. So if you're expecting a lot of money, 
it may be worth it for you to invest in some sort of CRM that also handles donations, something like Blackbaud, um, which used to be called Razor's Edge. Uh, if you're not expecting a lot, then something as simple as having like a Patreon page or uh, a Stripe account or a PayPal account could be enough. And so I think it's just really, there's a lot of things that go into it. So I can't just say this is the, the right platform. Any other questions, folks? One last time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate you giving us the time. Uh, as always, uh, your insight and expertise um, enthralls me. And truthfully, I learned something new every single time. I did not know the story that you started with before. So it was something that really intrigued me to, to learn about and uh, definitely harped on the overarching lesson here. So um, thank you all for participating. David, thank you once more. Uh, I appreciate you and we will have our next session starting at three. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks everyone. I hope you catch a bunch more Entrepreneurship Week sessions. Uh, make sure that you're following Launch SA, go to One Million Cups, don't forget that Helm My Business is still looking for people for the fall cohort. Uh, Break Fast and Launch is always looking for great people. And there's lots of fantastic resources out there like the SBDC, like SCORE, and it's just all up to you as entrepreneurs and as founders to go and engage with them. So get out there and make some cool things. Thank you again, David.